You're watching another episode of the Panasonic Foundation's Leadership in Equity series, where the conversations are anchored around equity. Joining us today is CEO and Director of the Newark Museum of Art, Linda Harrison. Hello, Linda. Hello, Angela. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. Okay, so first, tell me about that piece right behind you. That looks beautiful. What is it? You know what? Uh, people ask about this all the time, and I'm, I'm so happy that they do. This is a piece by my father-in-law. He retired um, as a um, psychiatrist um, in Berkeley, California, and started painting. And none of the family liked his paintings. They thought they were just kind of like just too out there. And my first time meeting him um, and Bunny, his wife, uh, for dinner uh, and they I was I was on my best behavior but I I said I absolutely loved his work and and people thought I was just um, the family thought I was trying to brown nose you know to make up brownie <laughs> points but I actually loved it and then um, I wound up um, receiving all of his paintings when he passed away oh my god William Bill Anderson love that okay we have to google that okay um, so I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, I know you have an amazing story. And one thing that I really want to dig into is this point of your life, you spent much of your career in corporate America. Yes. But then you switched to entrepreneurship, cashed in your 401k, and opened a bookstore. Yes. Okay, so please tell us what sparked that transition. Okay, not for the faint of heart, um, but I tell you uh, that um, a few friends of mine, um, actually there were about four of us, we, we said um, um, we were just ready to take all of those corporate skills that we had and um, why not um, just go into it and, and have our own shops? And one of my friends, um, he was with um, HP, he opened an Asian um, um, carpet shop. Um, another friend, he was with Price Waterhouse Cooper. He opened up a restaurant, a cafe, and I opened up the bookstore. We just said, hey, we can, we can do this. We, we, we run, you know, like multi-million dollar divisions uh, at our various uh, companies. And, and so we did, I, I said, okay, I'm going to take this leap. And we, we were selling out of print books. So beautiful books on architecture, interior design. Um, we, we just loved books and thought this would be a great way to do it. And we thought, we'll change the concept. We'll have actors read from the different books. Um, if we had um, novels or fiction um, and we would serve Bellinis um, and this would make these readings be fun <laughs> because yeah. people would go to readings and sometimes they go well I'm, I'm kind of boring um <laughs> but we just had to do it it was one of those bucket list um things uh transforming um this little block in the neighborhood and um ult ultimately we we all hung in there and then we somewhere we said mm, maybe we'll go back to <laughs> the corporate world. So I love how you talk about transforming uh, the block. So I'm curious, knowing that you've lived in Chicago, San Francisco, and now you're in Newark, what are some of the commonalities you've seen in these major cities and the role that arts plays in that? Well, you, you know, the one thing about the cities uh, that uh, I've lived in is that that commitment to like making it even better. How do, how do you really get the city uh, to be vibrant? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Chicago, uh, th this was a thing with um, a, a very vibrant neighborhood in Chicago. I grew up um, in Hyde Park, formerly known as, uh, well, it was formerly known as Hyde Park. Now it's like Obama land chic. Right. <laughs> but this, this, this neighborhood, um, as well as some of the neighborhoods on the North side, it, it lost its way a bit and then you want to um, revive it. Mm -hmm. I saw that even in a city like San Francisco and people think, oh, the beautiful and the fabulous San Francisco, um, but there was a major commitment um, by um, the various mayors there uh, to um, really revive 
um, uh, the South San Francisco, the downtown, um, and how do you do this? Um, and this is what I saw in Newark. Mm -hmm. And in each one of those cities, um, I saw the commitment to making this change. And really, how did you connect it? Through art. Yeah. Because if the art economy is not there, people can come to a city, they can come and they want to revive a, um, different neighborhoods. But if the city doesn't have that glue, then <clears throat> you're going into your corporate life, you do your thing, and then you're really waiting until you leave. Right. Um, and this is something that I um, had shared um, <clears throat> with the mayor in San Francisco and with uh, Mayor Baraka here that um, the culture economy, the culture workers, this is what then people turn their attention to. Um, once you know where you're living, once uh, all, all of you, your job is, is secure, as secure as it can be. Right. And you're, you're looking around, if I want to live, work, and play, where do I play? Mm -hmm. and, and then all the anchors can come together, whether it's the museum, the um, public uh, uh, performing arts, uh, uh, just the, the scene on um, uh, galleries and being able to gallery hop. I, I remember that was when I was like looking for the free cocktails. <laughs> I would do, okay, we're going to go to these like several galleries, but I, I, I am um, convinced that um, the art economy not only brings um, dollars into the city, but it's what really gives that city its joie de vie. Um, so you said a lot there, and I love the point where you hit on of just like developing kind of like the next generation of culture and culture creators. So it makes me think about Panasonic's partnership with the New York Museum of Art um, with the Explorers program, because we share a common goal of increasing access to STEM education. So talk a little bit about that and why you think these types of partnerships are needed. Yeah, I, I remember um, when I first got here and saw that Panasonic was here and then um, and I, I met Alex, I was uh, struck by how uh, the commitment, not just in dollars, um, but the commitment uh, to um, really participate in the education um, of the new, the next guard, if, if you will. Um, Panasonic was really going deep in this work. Um, and this is where you, the, the core value of one anchor um, institution with another um, anchor institution, we want the thought leadership as well. Mm -hmm. And this is something that um, Panasonic has uh, demonstrated in terms of, um, of um, the support um, of our Explorers program, which is um, where we connect also our uh, STEAM education, and that's the science, technology, art, um, and math. Um, and these kids, just when they are inspired in this way through art, there were um, um, teenagers in our Explorers program who um, had put together, uh, taken um, tennis shoes, put a device in the tennis shoe. They were inspired by a piece of art in our uh, Global African Arts Gallery and um, said, oh, this would be a new way um, for kids to be in touch with each other because everyone can't afford a phone. And, and, and that was just a, it was a wild reality um, mm -hmm. uh, for us. And this, we wouldn't be able to do this work without then partners who really understand this. Um, Megan Lee, who is um, your uh, leader, um, <laughs> is also my leader. She is on our board of trustees. And when she agreed to be a trustee, we were just thrilled because first of all, um, her knowledge um, in um, HR and just her knowledge business to business um, uh, 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 structures and how do we move forward? How do you, how do you change what you're doing. And here we are a museum that is in the midst of change. And so we need this type of uh, thought leadership and then need this type of motivation um, because kids then um, they put this together and they go, oh, I could work at Panasonic, but I could also work 
at the museum. Yes. Thank you for breaking that down. I, I love <laughs> the explorers. I wish I could have been an explorer. Don't and you? I, yes. I, I, it's like, where was this program um, <laughs> when, when I was a kid? This, this is what uh, gets me so excited about it because when I was a kid and I walked through a museum and I remember this uh, walking through the Art Institute in Chicago and I thought this museum was for white people, for white people only. And we got to visit because I looked around and I didn't really see a lot of people look like us and I didn't see um, art on the walls uh, that was reflective of us. And so I thought, oh, this is what we're supposed to do, go and, and see and look at other art <laughs> as part of our class. So when I walked through uh, the halls of um, uh, the Newark Museum of Art and, and I just see uh, the the, the K through eight kids and then the explorers walking around and then they're the, the uh, K through eight, they're looking up the, at the explorers like, wow, you know, the grownups, you know, so we really must look old when we walk past. <laughs> but it's, it's a great sense of uh, energy that I'm uh, committed to. So you raise a great point about representation. So mm. this leads me to my next question. Um, Shonda Rhimes in her book, Year of Yet, coined one of my like, favorite terms, FOD, which is first only different. Um, and in the book, she explains that this is a very select club that comes with a lot of extra pressures and responsibility. So I know you are one of six, I believe, African-American people leading a major museum in, in the United States. So yes. I would love to hear you kind of talk about um, what's it like being an FOD, <laughs> right? Right, and then how you've been able to remain authentic to yourself while stepping into these male and white dominated spaces. Oh, that's a that's a big question. Um, uh, I I believe that part of my experience in my corporate life. Um, was really managing teams that were, you know, it, there, there could be a hundred people on the team and um, 96 of them were white males at the time. Um, and so that the, the, the experience that I gained from um, adapting, um, uh, I, being able to, um, I need to be able to talk to you and so I need to be able to talk to you in a language that you may understand. And, and, and um, we, we all know, I was raised by my grandmother. So um, language like, how, how do you talk to folks when you walk out this door mm -hmm. for a host of reasons? Mm -hmm. um, and then that, that experience, like um, uh, decades really, allowed me to, um, really um, easily walk into or step into um, the, um, uh, the, the FOD, is that, is that? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I just love that. And now I got to get um, her book and, and read about that because um, often I was the only one in, it could have been in a, um, in a boardroom or uh, in a business situation or a team meeting and I, I really had to figure out now, what, what was I going to do? And then the early, I, I'd say early on into, in my career, I adapted to the point of making you so comfortable that I wasn't quite myself. It was a, almost a complete, I walk out of the room and now I'm completely different. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you do that for several years or 10 plus years moving up uh, the corporate ladder. And, and for me, it got to be, too exhausting. And so I, I remember when I had to slowly start adapting being my uh, full self and bringing my full self uh, to work and what that meant. And in that, then being more authentic because I was before, but it seemed like I was um, uh, 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 faking it sometimes when, mm -hmm. when I was just trying to, um, you know what, this is work and this is play. And the two will not meet. 
and and oh there's a third there 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 just is my general personal life and they shall not meet then i decided nope i'm going to bring them together be my authentic self whether i am talking to a board of trustees whether i am talking to a team and this really uh, started helping me to be able to coach teams and, and my staff, I want you to bring your authentic self uh, to work. And here I am, this Black, gay, married woman, and I am this successful corporate woman, and I am this person who loves to listen to great music and, and see old movies. I'm all these things, so all of these identities. Um, I'm comfortable in this meeting in Italy as I as in comfortable in San Francisco as in Newark. And so that when people know that, mm -hmm. it, it makes it an everyday thing. And then people don't have to um, uh, fear or be confused or not trust seeing a person like me in this role called CEO making these kinds of decisions because they're used to seeing someone not like me. Mm -hmm. So the more authentic I am, then it's like, oh, but you know what? We had a great year. We had a successful this. <laughs> we did the, the, it's like, oh, there, there are these different types of folks and they look different who are in that spectrum of our BIPOC community that then others can go, ah, it's not an anomaly. Right. Ah. I'm not a unicorn. Anomaly. You know? This Thank is every day, you. right? <laughs> this is what everyday success looks like in a businesswoman. And there are more. There are more. And and so I I I think sometimes, or at least for me, being the only one, sometimes it it is like, oh, I cannot fail. And so I really like to coach my team and others fail forward. Because the rap, the more rapidly you fail, we get to the bold idea, the innovation, the the um, uh, the, the the big new mm, shift that's going to help the organization or even help yourself. Okay, so I'm officially using fail forward from now on <laughs> because that is knowledge. I love that. I absolutely love. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay, so you literally answered the rest of my questions. So we're gonna go straight into <laughs> our rapid fire segment. Oh, you have no time. I'm gonna ask you, <laughs> and the first thing that comes to your mind is what you're gonna spit out. Okay. 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 <laughs> Favorite hype song. Happy by Pharrell. Yes, love that one. Yes. Yes. Um, Andy Warhol or Jean-Michel Basquiat? Okay, that's going to be Basquiat. Yes. The totally, all day. <laughs> yes. Beyonce or Beethoven? How about Miles Davis? Oh. Because <laughs> okay. that's just who I am, Miles Davis. I'm here <laughs> that's for who I love. Yes, okay, absolutely. Uh, last movie you saw? I'm a classic movie fan, so it was Rear Window because by a Hitchcock film, oh. because everybody is staying at home and looking out their windows and you know, all of that. I love Alfred Hitchcock. Do you, do you love Do you love Hitchcock films? I yeah. do. What's the Birds yeah. one? Is it called Birds? Oh yes, it's called The Birds. It's called The Birds. I look. I I am such a fan. I belong to the. You have you ever heard of Turner Classic? movies the tcm station oh my gosh my mom watches that all the time okay okay <clears throat> i'm down with your mom <laughs> <laughs> because i am a member and a fan and my wife and i we go on the turner classic movie film festivals in la and um when we could when we were on ships so you go on a ship you watch old films and you have lots of cocktails <laughs> The ship people love kiss. <laughs> okay. just love it, but I love a good Hitchcock film. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Last question. And I, I'm looking for a little bit more of that gems of wisdom to, to, to hear. <laughs> my grandmother once said, 
and you fill in the blank. She will always be a race woman. And that if I open a door, that I had better make sure that I keep that door open for someone to walk in behind me, especially a woman. It's my grandmother who raised me. I love that. The original race woman. Yes. Yes. She owned a beauty shop, south side of Chicago in High Park. And she always had the voting machines in her shop. I mean, she just did it all. I didn't know then that she was just the community leader. But she called herself a race woman. I love it. (laughs) Linda, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It has been my honor, Angela. You are fun to talk to. I've enjoyed it. And I am really look forward to talking with you again soon. Yes, let's do it. If you would like to learn more about the Panasonic Foundation, follow us on Instagram at Panasonic Foundation and Twitter at Panasonic FTN.